um, bit issue. So we, um, just to lay a little groundwork here, that um, what is your title there, Larry? Oh, the yeah, executive yeah. director. The executive director, Novitz, came in last week and um, gave us a report kind of on where we are and where they would like us to go. Mm -hmm. And he had a couple different phases. And um, we didn't have time for any other testimony or anything. I don't think we took any other testimony. But in any case, um, we have two bills on the wall. And then we have this suggestion that doesn't, what, it, it does have a bill, one of your suggestions. So um, Betsy has been tied up someplace, not literally, I don't think, but, um, and she, but she, we had about a half an hour um, between a couple witnesses before, and so she did a walkthrough of the 197, is that the number? 198. 198. 198. Okay. The, the newest bill, which um, Senator Polina has suggested would replace the other bill that he introduced last year, because this would be step one, and then the, the next bill would be kind of step two. So we have had a walk through of that, and I apologize um, that you didn't all, all didn't get to hear it. But I think it's pretty simple. It um, suggests giving the authority to the um, Ethics Commission to uh, establish and propose to the legislature next year an enforceable state code of ethics. Is that, and then it extends their, um, the funding mechanism for them at least another year, because that kind of sucks it. So, so that is what the bill is. So with that, um, we will, knowing that that's what we're looking at here, if we want to have some testimony, and we have a lot of people here. We have Paul Burns, Chris Winter, Catherine Rader, I don't see here yet, Gwyn Zakoff, Beth Festigi, your Beth. Beth is not here, but Tom is right. back. Yeah, <laughs> you look a lot like Beth. Um, and Larry Nolan, so. Bless you. And so Paul, would you like to start off? <clears throat> sure. Thank you, Madam Chair, and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Paul Burns. I'm the Executive Director of the Vermont Public Interest Research Group. Um, it has been you know, my pleasure to work uh, with this committee on a number of different bills. This is now the start of my 20th legislative year here. I don't know that I've been here every year on a campaign finance or ethics or uh, related proposal, but a lot of them. And so, and, and it is fair to say that uh, some very significant and important bills have uh, come out of this committee. Many of them started in this committee. Many of them have become important uh, state laws. And again, it has been um, an honor on behalf of my organization to work on many of those uh, with, with you and with your predecessors. Um, included among those would be the creation of the Ethics Commission, and that legislation, of course, had other provisions in it dealing with pay to play and, um, and, and other provisions that um, don't, that are not specifically before you today and are not specifically about the Ethics Commission itself. Um, some of you may have seen that I recently had some comments about the Ethics Commission um, and my observations. Um, were uh, fairly reflected in that article um, with one possible exception, and it, and it was just uh, more of an omission. And, and that really was my feeling that the law as it currently stands is not working. Um, and if the question was, do we keep what we have today, um, uh, yeah, just as it is, um, my thought is that is worse than nothing, that we shouldn't keep the Ethics Commission just as it stands today. And I'd be happy to explain why I feel that way. 
But my preference is really to improve the Ethics Commission, um, to strengthen it, to give it the resources um, and the authority that it needs to carry out the functions that I think most people would expect the State Ethics Commission to do. So I wanted to just note that off the bat that um, it is my hope that Vermont can join the ranks of states with you know, a functioning ethics commission, a place where people can go to seek um, uh, some sense of, of justice, to have an investigation occur, to look into a complaint, to know that a complaint would be taken seriously, would be investigated, that there would be some determination about whether the set of facts amounts to a violation of a state code of ethics, and if such a violation is found, that some uh, penalty or enforcement action would result from that. I think that is a reasonable public expectation if you're talking about having an ethics commission. You know, what would happen if, if we had this body up and running? And we are an awful long way from having that today in the current Ethics Commission. You heard some of that uh, from Executive Director Novins last week. Um, and it's not a surprise, I think, to any of you. I mean, we, we knew from the start what this law was. It was, there was conversation at the time that perhaps it would, after it's up and running for a, a period of time, that the legislature may address this question of increasing the resources and, and um, adding additional authority and responsibility. And um, yet, I know that among the considerations are some that, in my mind, would weaken uh, and not strengthen the Ethics Commission or weaken the public's capacity, reduce the public's capacity to have some sort of a transparent process where they could um, identify uh, uh, some potential wrongdoing or even ask about whether something is um, uh, is in line with our state's code of ethics and have uh, have some sort of a response from an ethics commission and um, and again there seems to be interest in retreating from that part of the law as it exists today uh, the bill that you have um, before you for consideration this year, I appreciate the idea of putting the state's the code as it exists today or in some modified form into statute. There's no argument that that, that should happen. I, no argument for me to <laughs> say that that should happen. That, that is clearly one of the means by which some of the other functions that I was referring to earlier could then be carried out, um, that an investigation could occur, that some determination could be made, and that some enforcement action could be taken, or, or not, if, if an investigation determines that there is no wrongdoing there, and then it remains quiet. Um, but, uh, but it doesn't seem to me reasonable that it would take I mean, the period of time that we're talking about here for a phase one, which would be to ask Larry essentially to go back and come up with a code that you would consider next year, and then after that, presumably come back in the perhaps 2022 legislative session to determine who that code of ethics might apply to, and perhaps determine what kind of resources or enforcement capacity could result uh, either in that session or a session beyond that. It's a, it's a very long and drawn out process and it seems to me, I mean we are where we are today, but uh, more preparation could have been done coming into this session so that you had before you something to consider. I, I'm frankly, I'm not entirely sure what you need beyond you have a code right now, um, and that would be useful to look at, presumably when you're talking about creating a state code of ethics in statute. <laughs> There is no mystery about the other state codes. Uh, there are something like 47 of them out there, and um, those could be evaluated um, to determine whether or not you wanted to do something uh, like one or another of those um, as well. But to my mind, the, the question is whether we persist and how long we persist with what is essentially a toothless uh, commission. Um, and 
I, I would note that term is not one that I came up with, but the, there is a report by Coalition for Integrity, Enforcement of State of, of Ethics Rules by State Ethics Agencies. I will send you a link um, to this. It's a, it's a fairly lengthy piece, and you can decide whether you want to print them out. But it is a, an examination of uh, the state codes of ethics and the commissions and how they carry out their work in the various states that have them today. Some recommendations are made in here, and I will share some of those with you. Um, but their first recommendation um, is this, that a toothless ethics agency serves no purpose. Agencies need wide powers to investigate and sanction all government personnel. Um, and this gets to my point uh, that, you, that you may have read about, which is, you know, is it really better to have nothing than what we have today? Uh, does a toothless ethics agency serve no purpose? I think it serves no valid purpose. I think it serves some purpose, and I hope it is not one that you want to pursue, which is that it offers some protection to state officials um, to, from the criticism that you might otherwise get, and that, frankly, you were getting, or your predecessors were getting, for having no ethics commission at all. When Vermont was one of, uh, maybe it was three states without any ethics commission at all, I will tell you, we use that, VPIRG used that, a number of others used that as a one reason why we should take some action here. I mean, why should Vermont be among the small, not even a full handful of states without some sort of a commission in place where people could go to issue a complaint or seek an advisory question or you know, uh, advisory uh, advice from a commission and so forth. And I think the legislature was persuaded that some action should be taken and that we should join the ranks of states with it. But if, if it is truly toothless, then I think it gives um, a false sense to the public that you have addressed a problem that you really have not yet addressed. Right now, it is a funnel, you know, a place where a complaint can be received and given to somebody else, and in most cases, very little seems to happen even at that. Um, and without a state code of ethics, it's a valid question about what can happen. I mean, under the current, the way the law is currently written, it is true that no one, none of those enforcing bodies, whether it's the Attorney General or the Department of Human Resources or anybody else, could say, because we have found that there is a violation of the Code of Ethics that the Commission adopted, we're going to take some enforcement action. I mean, there's nothing under the current law that would empower any of those officials to act that way. So again, putting something into statute is a good idea, um, but it's, I think if you're gonna go that route, I would encourage you to move more rapidly and to at the same time consider who that could apply to and what kind of resources you might give so that some enforcement actions could be taken. I also think that if you're looking at, um, if you don't move forward to adopt a code of ethics and statute this year and you, and you require some further investigation or study or analysis that you should look at how it could apply to all state employees, including, with all due respect, the members sitting around this table. I know what the Constitution says, um, and, and, it, and some have suggested that that means that only the members of the Senate can take any enforcement action against a member of your body, and the same for the House of Representatives. I'm not sure that um, I would agree that that means that no action could be taken. Certainly it means that nobody else could come in and say you are removed from office for an ethical uh, violation of some sort. But perhaps it is possible that some other means of pointing out that a violation has occurred would be allowed. And the question is more about what sanctions um, would result from that. So that too would provide some uh, benefit, it seems to me, if there were a uh, commission that could at least make that judgment. Some of the other recommendations that I think you want to consider uh, that were contained in this report, that proceedings of the ethics agency should be open to the public once there is a determination that probable cause exists, that a violation has occurred. That would be a result of an investigation. And it says that there should be no difference in terms of transparency between, between a criminal indictment, which is public, 
um, and a finding of probable cause for an ethics violation. That's something that I, I don't recall there being consideration around that last time, but there is this question about when transparency can occur. And it is not necessarily at the filing of a complaint, for sure, but once you pass some sort of measure of, of determination that, um, that there is a, uh, a reasonable cause, uh, then some openness to the process, it seems to me, is worthwhile. If the ethics agency determines that a violation has occurred, its findings and sanctions should be publicly available. Confidential letters of reprimand carry little weight in deterring behavior. And Finally, it notes that to increase incentives for compliance, penalties should be meaningful. Uh, that's a conversation for another day, but I think the point is, is rather obvious uh, there. The question would be, could any penalties come to members of the legislature for the reasons that we cite um, before? I would also urge you to consider a time limit on the, if under the current law, if something is funneled off to an agency for consideration, there is no time limit on when they can, you know, how long they can take. They can take years of uh, considering whether there is any violation there. You, even if you push off the, the question of uh, adopting a code of ethics and statute this year, you could put a time limit on how long the agencies that currently receive those complaints have to consider whether a violation has occurred. Um, that might encourage more public participation in the process. Uh, as you know, the Department of Human Resources has no code of ethics uh, of its own right now. Um, there are uh, pieces of what kind of amounts to a code in different places. Um, again, if you want to, before acting on a statute, uh, a statutory code of ethics, you could require the Department of Human Resources to take some measures to put their different pieces in one place so that if somebody were to visit their website, you could find at least what they consider to be their code of ethics now. That would probably somebody could do that in a day and a half. Um, that would be helpful given that the, our current law refers to a Department of Human Resources code of ethics. Um, and so, there are almost uh, triage measures that I would urge you to consider if you do put off for a lengthy period um, the adoption of a state statute. There, I, uh, with respect to the advisory opinions, I know that some of us have gone around on this a few times before, regardless of whether you believe that it was legislative intent um, to require that or to limit um, those who could request an advisory opinion to uh, current state employees. Um, that is not what the law says now. That's not what you adopted, and I understand that you may consider changing that. But, but let me say that if you, if you do that, if you make that change and you say that no longer will we allow a member of the public to request an advisory opinion. Uh, don't pat yourselves on the back for that one as though you're doing it for the citizens of this state. It wouldn't be good for the public to take away that opportunity for them to request an advisory opinion um, from the State Ethics Commission. It would further insulate elected officials and appointed officials in the state from the indignity of having some investigation about something that they or their colleagues are doing. Um, and I don't think that, my hope is that you don't view your primary job as to protect elected officials or appointed officials from the indignity of having questions raised about whether something that they're doing might be a violation of the state's code of ethics. And, and here, I guess I need to be specific as you know, VPIRG had filed a, initially a complaint about the governor's um, uh, ongoing uh, financial uh, interest in his former construction business while that business um, seeks and wins state contracts. When we first filed the complaint, we were told that no state code of ethics existed yet, so it was premature. We waited until the code was adopted in the summer of uh, 18 uh, and then filed the request for an advisory opinion so that that process would be more transparent. 
uh, that timing had to do with when the state code of ethics was adopted. And the commission, as you know, issued its advisory opinion in that case. And that advisory opinion uh, found, and it could have been written perhaps in a more vague manner without reference to the governor, um, but it found under the circumstances that there really is no public dispute around that there are multiple violations of the current code of ethics given the set of facts as they apply to the governor. And really, I haven't heard anything from the commission that disputes the merits of that decision. Uh, now there is question about whether VPIRG had the right to request an advisory opinion. Again, according to the law, there's no question about it. There is no restriction to state employees here. There is a restriction on who can request guidance. Uh, but any court would look at that and say, okay, this paragraph, they say it's limited to state officials. One, two, three paragraphs down, they don't limit it to state officials. That is a strong indication that there was not an intent on the part of the legislature to so limit it. So the commission offered that advisory opinion and then took it back. Not only did they say it was improper, but they took it down, which in this day and age is kind of comical to suggest that, geez, we're, we're going to pretend that it never existed. Um, the point is, they said, okay, you can file a complaint. So we filed a complaint, and for nearly two months we have heard nothing from the Department of Human Resources on that. It will be interesting to see what they finally say. Uh, but I, I believe that the public is better served by having an opportunity, and even if the requirement is, um, uh, that the, any advisory opinions be written in such a manner as that you, it's not about a particular individual, that's fine. But it is entirely possible that somebody could say, hey, it's, uh, I, see our, uh, I see a legislator who has this relationship and is doing this kind of thing, I have a question about that. It might trigger an advisory opinion that could be valuable to you, to your colleagues, but just because it didn't come from, the question didn't come from you doesn't mean that there isn't some viable reason, some benefit for having that question considered and addressed by the Ethics Commission. Put another way, the only person, according to the changes that I believe you're considering, uh, were you to limit the focus of the advisory opinions in the manner that the commission has already done, would be to say only the governor can request an advisory opinion about whether he has a conflict in this case. And if the governor chooses not to do that, then no one else is empowered even to request an opinion about it. That would be the effect of the change that you're considering, and that is not in the public's interest. So that's my uh, appeal on that question, not to argue about whether it was your intent originally or not, but just to say there's actually value in allowing people other than those who are in this situation to request an advisory opinion from a commission, particularly given the fact that both the executive director of the commission and, and members of this committee and your counterparts in the House have recognized that one of the most important aspects of the commission is to educate and to get information out so that you can avoid conflicts and not to take enforcement action, not to take complaints or anything else. But it seems like you're missing an opportunity to potentially address some of those situations by making sure that the public is not allowed to ask even for an advisory opinion. So uh, the sum is, I think it is right to move forward to put the code into statute. It seems to me there's some possibility that, as you were considering last week, that you could move even in this session to, um, to make that happen. I hope that you will move as rapidly as possible to consider the other questions about who that applies to, what resources that uh, the commission has to enforce that, and what authority it has to enforce um, against anyone found to be in violation of the code. And then I'm happy to provide other information on some of the other specific suggestions that I made. Um, and um, I appreciate the opportunity to share these thoughts with you today. Thank you. I, I, and we will, um, and I will argue with you until I turn blue in the face about the advisory opinions, because it clearly says 
may issue to an executive officer or other state employee upon his or her request an advisory opinion regarding any provision of this chapter or any issue related to governmental ethics. The intent always was to give advice to the people who were covered. That's for guidance, not for no. advice. Well, unless, unless it got changed in the final executive director advisory opinions. Uh, that doesn't say that it comes only to, that may, may issue to the executive officer or state employee, I believe, refers to guidance. And down below it says may issue advisory opinions that provide general advice. It doesn't limit it. That, that's on the reports, right? No, uh, if you yeah, mind handing that down, that's... But out. anyway, that, that really was, that always was the intent. To well, fit, um, I'm saying, uh, Madam Chair, though, that the plain language there is that the restriction applies to guidance, not to advisory opinions. I, I'm not debating about the intent, and, and that may be true, and it is, of course, your authority to change that now. I would argue that it was not within the authority of the commission to make that change, absent the direction, absent the passing of a new law here. And yet, that is what the commission has done. I think okay. it's completely inappropriate. Okay. And I, I know, and we will remain disagreeing on that. Uh, and I, and I, I, I uh, no, okay. Uh, the intent always was that the guidance would be, I could, I could call and ask for guidance. Is this an ethical violation? Could this, can you give me some guidance on this? So 17 of us call on the same question. The commission then says, 17 of you are concerned about the same thing. I'm going to give an, a general advisory opinion about this issue. And that, that was the intent. And if we wrote it wrong, we got it wrong, and we can always change it. Or, or we can um, let other people give an advisory opinion get, or ask for one. But that was the intent. That is exactly the way we um, envisioned it. So. Certainly, that makes perfect sense. The, the description that you describe, or the, the scenario that you describe, the only question is whether you want to make sure that there isn't another opportunity there for the public. So if multiple people who are elected officials have a similar kind of question that an advi a general advisory comes up, of course, that makes perfect sense. The question is whether you allow anybody else to ask the question. Yeah, yeah I, get, I get that. Uh, Anthony, do you Sure, I guess um, a couple things. Um, first of all, I, I appreciate and I agree really with your analysis of the status of the commission as it is. It's obviously turned out to be a very weak organization, probably weaker than any of us had hoped for or imagined, so I appreciate that. The quandary is how we move forward, quite honestly. Um, and what we need to begin with, I believe, I, and I could be wrong, because there could be further discussion about this, but before we talk about who can issue complaints or file, ask for guidance, whatnot, before we get into those questions, they're kind of irrelevant if we don't have an enforceable code of ethics for, for, for the commission to react to and for the citizens to react to. So the question is whether we can come up with an enforceable code of ethics now or whether we have just going to take more time to do that and i don't want us to move backwards because i hear what you're saying about the other things the triage and so that, that there might be possibilities there so i would put those aside for now because mm -hmm. my major question is whether or not we have the ability as a, as a group and upstairs in the full senate to actually adopt this the, a enforceable code of ethics make it into statute make it into law between now and let's say March or whatever, we would have to have it done. I think there would, be no better, there would be a lot of debate that would happen, and a lot of disagreement that would have to be overcome so we could form a consensus. I would hate to bring something up to the Senate and have it fail because there's too many questions and you know what all those questions would be because we've been through them yeah. before. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. Is, I mean, I, would, I think it would make more sense to take the time necessary to have a Enforceable code of ethics drawn up with input from DPRG and the ACLU and others, and have a process by which the, the commission develops the code of ethics that we can all then go to the Senate and actually defend and be enthusiastic about it, have it pass. And I, I have a hard time believing. I'm not totally. I'm 
kind of fun, flexible on this, but I have a hard time believing we can do that between now and when we have to do the crossover. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. Um, I agree with your triage. I need to do certain things, but maybe we can do some of those things as we go ahead and give them the power, power them to do the code of ethics. But I just have a hard time imagining we're going to be able to do it in time to have it, have it be successful. I think we could throw them together if we bring it up to the seventh floor. And you remember the debates we've had about campaign finance reform. They go on and on and on. And this is even harder than that, I would imagine. So that's, anyway, that will be redundant. That's where I'm coming from. Uh, you can disagree. Well, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I, you, as a body, will be considering even more complicated things where there are fewer examples of other states that have led the way. Um, I'm thinking to Chairman Bray here is grappling with a few things of how to you know, deal with the climate crisis. Um, there are only a couple of states that have done uh, the kinds of things that we're contemplating doing now. This, Adopting a code of ethics and some sort of plan for enforcing it is something that more than 40 states have already done. So I'm not really disagreeing with what we might expect to happen on the floor of the Senate. That's real world politics. I guess I just want to recognize from my position that that is a problem of political will more than it is a problem of not being able to figure out a reasonable proposal that could be brought to uh, the floor. And, and fair enough, you know, so sometimes it is the right question about strategically what will it take to build enough support um, in this body and in, and in the other chamber to pass something. Um, I'm not inflexible about this, but, I, but I, I represent, you know, the public in this as well, and I just need to say that I think it is not a question of, you know, being incapable or figuring out what we need to do. From 45 other states have this. Um, yeah, but it's, I mean, not to interrupt, but it, you, you're right, it's political will, and I think in my time here, the hardest time we've had in passing laws have not been laws that affect the environment or consumerism, it's laws that affect the chamber itself, the legislature yeah. itself is where we've had the most resistance, so just... You know, I agree, yeah. your job is not easy in that, and Madam Chair, you're as lead here, I, I've seen you take difficult issues to the floor, and I've seen you win, and I've seen you... Um, uh, See, others you know, exact their pound of flesh, I guess, uh, yeah. as well. I, I'm not suggesting that any of this is easy. I guess I'm trying to be, my job is to encourage you to move as quickly and forcefully as you can in order to achieve success. And, you know, that may not be this year for all that I want to see, but if you put it off, then my request would be that it's not limited to simply asking the commission to come back with a code that you can then consider next year. But let's look at some of those other issues about how that can be enforced and, and what kind of resources we need and all of those other issues so that in the 2021 session, at least, you know, you're looking at, at the broader range of issues that would go with that. Yeah. Uh, that makes sense. I'll disagree with that. Yeah. So if we had an enforceable code of ethics, there were only 23 complaints last year. Um, I guess my question is, 23 complaints isn't a lot. And so I think we need to think very carefully about what we mean by the resources that go into it and the enforcement capabilities and what kind of resources need to go there for 23 complaints, some of them were on municipalities, and they aren't even covered under here, and, and that's a whole other issue that I'm not sure, we certainly aren't, um, don't have the ability this year to address that, but if we ha would we have a lot more complaints if we had an enforceable code of ethics, or are we looking at, because I don't know that the public out there knows that it's not they're, they're not enforceable, so would I, I guess my concern is 23 complaints is not a lot, and some of them are, um, and only about uh, most of them are closed. So. Well, so what do you do with that? I mean, you I, could argue we don't need an ethics commission, I suppose. I, I, I don't. I. No, I think we need some place for people to go, but how? What we need how they need to be structured and how, what resources they need in terms of investigation and enforcement and stuff is 
I think we need to look at. Yeah, I think there's a possibility that if there was an enforceable code of ethics and more teeth in the ethics commission, and there were one or two, I guess I would say high profile, for lack of a better way of putting it, cases that were resolved that the public was aware of, it would open the eyes of the public up to the idea that there was an ethics commission. And I think there might be more interest in bringing questions. Assuming we have some high pro profile. Right. Well, we had one. Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean. Yeah. And Let's face it, what has happened so far is there's nothing that would encourage members of the public to think that they're going to have satisfaction by going down this path. As you say, they may not know that, but, they, but most people aren't aware that there is a state ethics commission. There hasn't been an awful lot of um, public outreach yet around this, and there is no reason why my organization would do much to encourage our uh, thousands of members across the state to uh, participate in this process given the experience that we've had thus far. I would say that, you know, by comparison, uh, according to this, Massachusetts had more than a thousand complaints filed. Um, it's roughly ten times the population, I think. Um, uh, so, you know, it's not as though we're going to be, we're not going to have a thousand complaints filed um, in Vermont, uh, but, you know, might we have somewhere between 23 and 100 if it were highly functioning. Uh, that's probably not an unreasonable expectation if you had uh, a, a more information out there about this process. So uh, th there's more information, too, from other states, other states closer to our size. And, and so again, I'll, I'll make sure that this goes to all of you, and it might be helpful as you consider that. But that's not a decision you necessarily need to make today. Um, but I, I think that that would be worthwhile to consider as part of the broader process. So you, do you have um, those those trios? I, I mean, I tried to write them down when you were giving yeah, them, like I, the I, I would, code of, DHR code of ethics and the time limit and yes, some of and, those um, other. And there may be some more. What I would like to do is follow up with some written. I would be happy okay. to share with you some written thoughts okay. uh, that may, may expand on that a little bit as well. Um, I will do that in the next couple of days. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Didn't mean to argue with you. <laughs> <laughs> but we probably always will. <laughs> So, Chris, did you? Thank you. For the record, Chris Winters, Deputy Secretary of State. And I'll just start off by saying, you know, as someone who spent a lot of time in this building advocating for an ethics commission a couple of years ago, uh, it's really hard to see it kind of floundering um, and not have uh, the tools that we think it needs to succeed. So I, I want to thank you for the opportunity to come back and talk about the Ethics Commission on behalf of the Secretary of State's office. Uh, as I think you know, in my role as Deputy Secretary of State, I get fewer calls now because we have Jenny Prosser who takes most of them, but I, I often get a lot of calls from local officials, uh, sometimes about state agencies and state government, uh, from concerned citizens who uh, have questions about open meetings, public records, things like conflict of interest. And, and they would see as unethical behavior, sometimes is unethical behavior. Uh, a lot of what I hear is kind of one-sided. I'm getting one half of the story, and I'm not doing any investigation or trying to figure out the other side of it. Um, but these are real issues and real problems that people have, and they've in, in the past really had nowhere to turn, and now they do have an ethics commission. And with respect to the, you know, the 23 complaints and whether we would see them go up, I really think we would if we had an enforceable code of ethics, if people were clear about what is expected of our state and even our local, especially our local officials, um, and what constitutes a violation. We'd have even more complaints if they thought those complaints would go anywhere, that the Ethics Commission had the, the teeth to do something about it. Um, I do want to emphasize what Secretary Condos often says about our public officials. It's, it's not as though corruption is running rampant through these green mountains. We don't think that's the case. But there are a lot of people who don't know what the law is, don't know where the line is. So with, with that res in that respect, having a code of ethics, a clear code of ethics, can help educate them as to what their responsibilities are as a local official, as a, as a public official. Um, I really think we, we, we still, you know, a couple of years ago I was arguing this, and we still are kind of at a crossroads, I would say. Um, you know, more than ever, Americans are cynical about government in general. They, you see a lot of cynicism pointing toward Washington, D.C., but that translates into a lot of cynicism about Montpelier as well and about state government. 
Um, you just you look back at the 2016 presidential election, see how many people stayed home during that election. People are apathetic, they're frustrated, uh, and increasingly frustrated by what they see. So I, you know, we believe at the Secretary of State's office that we really have to do everything we can in our small corner of the world to combat that apathy and that sense that government isn't representing the interests of the people. We want to make sure our government's working for the people and accountable to them is the language from the Vermont Constitution. So when you were discussing the original bill a few years ago, we advocated strongly for, for three things, independence, authority, and resources. Um, we said at the time that without all three of those things, we thought the commission would have a really hard time, would possibly fail. And uh, as we've stated, we think we got one out of three. We've got the independence. We don't think they have adequate resources or authority at this point. So we still believe that the commission should have enforcement authority and some additional staffing to deal with it. We think it's an investment in good government and would be well worth the cost. We'd see the savings to pay for the commission. Um, while we wish that the legislature had gone further with that in the initial bill and the commission's authority and resources, we did say and continue to say it was a good start. Um, so as a next step, even if it is a small one, we think that enforceable, not enforceable, that state code of ethics uh, and education on that code in particular would be a good idea. Uh, as we were edu uh, um, as we were promoting and advocating for an ethics commission, we did emphasize setting clear standards and that education should come first, enforcement should come second, and we'd see a lot of the problems go away. Uh, so to that end, we support a state code of ethics as a next step, and we do hope that you would continue to look at how to strengthen the commission and give it a fighting chance uh, in succeeding. So thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm sorry, I'm going to have I do have to leave or I would stay, but I'm um, very interested in the conversation. Um, did, you, did you want to have anything? Uh, I think at this time, we don't have anything to say. I'm really here to listen. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. No, thanks. Yeah, please. Please. Thank you. Larry Novins, uh, Executive Director of the Tufa Ethics Commission. <laughs> um, carrying on from our conversation last Friday, uh, we talked about an ethics code and the need for one, and the sense I got from you, the message that I thought, and I'm pretty sure I heard, was that if we, if we can get to a code sooner rather than later, that would be a good thing. And, uh, and you asked me if I could give you, I, I said I had a draft available, and I dropped it off with the committee this morning, um, of a possible code of ethics. This is a compilation of uh, provisions taken that reflect in part the, uh, the current ethics code, parts are taken from codes of other states and federal government parts uh, are taken from the governor's executive order uh, governing um, executive branch uh, individuals. And I think that would be an excellent place to begin a discussion. I don't know when you would be interested in going in, into it in any detail. It's not in a format that it's not a pure legislative format, but I think it's pretty close in terms of the content, the substance of it. Um, and I think it would be a good opportunity to start a discussion on this. My sense is if we can move on this um, sooner rather than later, that would be to everybody's benefit. I, I agree with, with Paul and Chris and, and everyone else who talks about the need uh, for a, a state legally binding uh, code and then the discussion on enforcement should come as soon as possible. Um, whether it's immediate or the next step, uh, I will leave to your judgment. My sense was uh, I would be more interested in accomplishing the possible, and I worry that making it too big and too broad and getting into all the enforcement provisions at this time uh, might make you know the the enemy or the what is the expression the perfect an enemy of the good. Um, and I would not want to sacrifice the opportunity to come up with a good code um, by getting too deeply involved in, in all the enforcement. As I said on Friday, there are many, many questions to be asked and answered um, about what an enforcement process would look like. And 
Paul's question exactly right. You know, at what point does it become public? What do the hearings look like? What process is, is followed? Um, all those need uh, consideration. And then the obvious one is if and well, when, I hope, uh, when we have an ethics code and when we have enforcement, um, it's going to require more resources. So that, that's my brief outline. I don't know what else to say at this point. But. And I think I, when I, when we talked about it last time, I think I was maybe a little bit overly um, optimistic mm -hmm. that we could actually come up with with something. I. Um, when I think about it, we have now uh, 23 days left until crossover. So we have, and one of those is going to be used for an evacuation exercise. So we have 22 days. And um, I'm sure other things will come up that take us, take our afternoon time. So I, when I think, when I thought about it, um, at the insistence of other people that I examine my own optimism. Um, I, I just look at this and I say, public servants shall not use their official positions for personal or financial gain. What exactly does that mean? How is it going to affect me as a legislator? How is it going to affect Betsy and as a state employee? How, what, what, and I, and I don't know that we have the the time to, we could adopt this, but these are going to be, um, public servants shall not make use of state materials, funds, property, personnel, facilities, or equipment for any purpose other than for official state business unless the, it's specifically permitted or required by law. So when I'm working at my desk, can I make calls to set up my dentist appointments because that is not official state business. I, I mean, these are the kinds right. of questions that are going to come up, and I think we need to think through each of these things very, very carefully so that we, we know the answers. Because those are, you know, can I, can I make those phone calls to make my dentist appointment or to arrange for babysitting for my kids or or to um, apply for the job that I have to have when I leave here in May. Uh, and, and those are the kinds of questions. So I think I was a little bit overly optimistic. And I think that we should read through this and, and we'll continue some testimony. But that's, so I think I led you down the garden path. I eagerly followed. Um, yes, you eagerly followed yeah. me, but. But that, you know, if, if nothing else, if this will start a discussion, mm -hmm. I think when you look at codes of other states, you will find them remarkably similar to what we have here and enforceable. Um, and the other question that I would wonder is how long it took them to do it. Did, were, were they done by some executive fiat or, or were they legislatively done? And do they do. Did it take them a year? Did it take them a month? Are they full-time legislators? Or do they have staff to work on these issues? I, I mean, I think that they're, right. so. I don't have those answers. Yeah. I know there was I, over 40 states by statute. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I mean, I know that they're there. Yeah. And, and mostly in response to, uh, well, a lot of them followed Watergate. Um, a lot right. of them were in response to local problems, um, people finding new and different ways to commit unethical conduct. Um, so a lot of them are responsive, but some of them are basically uh, adopted as a body uh, to set a standard, and that's what I'm hoping we can do here whenever it happens. And I think we also have to ask, begin to ask questions about like who is covered. Are we going to include municipalities in here? Because we have not. Are we going to include boards and commissions? Because that's one yes. of the things you pointed out, yeah. that they, they aren't covered at all. We have about 300 boards and commissions, and what does that mean for them to not use their, um, when, you're, when your board is meeting, can they meet in your office and make those personal phone calls? I, I don't know what that means. So anyway, 
Well, we would welcome the conversation whenever you want to get to it. Well, we definitely will get to the conversation of 197. I mean, we'll. 198. Uh, what? 198? OK, 198. Thank you. <coughs> Somebody needs to keep track of me in here. Um, but so we'll definitely go that far. And I think that we can look at some of the things that Paul was talking about in terms of um, other steps in my yeah, well, I was indicated last week, and, and I agree with Paul. I mean, the, the variations among the states are massive, and there are plenty of, of areas where we could, you know, sort of pick and choose what will fit Vermont best. Well, and he had some things like the time limit. Do we need to put some mm -hmm. kind of a time limit on there? If that's an issue, let's look at that. And no, we certainly don't want to make it any weaker. No. 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 I'm sorry. We certainly do not want to make it any weaker. No. no. So. That would be difficult, I think, at this point. Well, I bet we could. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we want, we don't want to, but I bet we could. <laughs> so, anything else? Yes, Can I make a quick comment? Yes, um, please. Identify yourself for the record. Yeah, so Eric Lamonte, I'm Executive Director at Campaign for Vermont. Uh, I don't have any real prepared statements, but I just want to remind you folks that when this went through the first time, we had, you know, VPIRG was there, Campaign for Vermont was there, ACLU, mm -hmm. Ethan Allen Institute. Uh, I mean, how often do you see VPIRG and Ethan Allen Institute working together on something? You know, it, it, you had a, a group of organizations that came together from a lot of really, really diverse backgrounds politically. This is an issue of vital importance to Vermont. I understand it's difficult, it's going to take a lot of work, a lot of discussion, but this matters to all Vermonters across the spectrum, and please don't forget that mm -hmm. as you're faced with both this priority and your other priorities. We, yes, we agree, actually. Yeah. It, it is a matter of time and resources. In your You've taken um, over a campaign for Vermont. I don't think you've been in here yet. Have you? And I, I sat in uh, on a couple last year. I was okay. just kind of listening, getting my feet underneath me. Good, go cool. welcome.